design for stage. And there you go. Um, design for stage and screen. So I was originally going into production design and costume design, but I fell in love with my material culture and visual culture classes. So I ended up doing a master's in design history and material culture at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. And basically melded those two degrees together and became a glorified set dresser at Strafford Hall. So I'm, I started the same day as Kelly and I love it here. So let's see how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I want to start out by thanking the Thomas Lee chapter, the DAR, who sponsored this talk. It's always wonderful to give tours to the DAR groups and have support from them. They are an incredible resource for sites like ours. So <clears throat> we decided to do this topic because of many reasons. We just introduced ourselves. We're very excited about stuff, right? What makes a world? You know, I think history can be taught so statically, you know, names and timelines, and it's very sort of straight and boring. We like to color that history in by talking about things like food, fashion, um, design, you know, furniture, all the things that really make our history light up the same way that we live in certain spaces now and adore a certain print on a chair. These kinds of thoughts and desires are very much a part of the Lee family as well. So we decided to sort of, you know, take all of the textures of daily life and present this idea of what was life like for Mr. and Mrs. Lee, the first family of Stratford. We have an incredible collection here. A lot of it is after their period, but we wanted to take a moment and really talk about that early family what life was like here at Stratford Hall. What were they thinking about on a daily basis? What did they think about when they got up to eat dinner? I mean, to eat breakfast or eat lunch or supper? What did they think about as they were putting their wig on their head to be Mr. Thomas Lee? All of those sort of textures of daily life. And it would help if I used the clicker that actually worked. All right, hold on a second here. Still not. Hello, come on in. Hi. I'll just have to press the button. Okay. All right. All right. So we're just getting started. So I want to start off by just making sure we all understand what we're talking about today. What is the material world of the leaves? Material culture is stuff. It's everything that is tangible that represents your culture, whether it's the plates you eat off of, the seat that you're sitting in, the, sh the shoes that you wear. And we wanted to really sort of build this very illustrative um, picture of who the, the Lees were when they first came here to Stratford Hall. So I wanna introduce you very quickly to Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Lee. Um, they are our Stratford's first family, <clears throat> excuse me. Thomas Lee was a very, very famous Virginian. Um, he was born in 1690 to Letitia and Richard Lee II. He was the third generation here in Virginia, his grandfather, Richard the Immigrant, came through Jamestown. So he had very deep old roots in the state of Virginia, in the, in the British colony. He was very much involved in land acquisition. He married Hannah in 1722, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, their sort of love story, um, if you will. And they, he started a political career here as well. He did everything from working um, at the House of Burgesses to serving as the, um, on the Council of Virginia. And he also acted and served as the president, pretty much governor of Virginia as well. So he was a pretty important character here in the colony of Virginia. He was also one of the founders of the Ohio Company, which got him very much involved in Western migration, um, dealing with really important uh, sort of relationships with the Iroquois, the Native American <laughs> group up in the New York, Ohio area. And he was a very important, prominent, very wealthy Virginian. In 1742, he and Hannah moved to Stratford Hall with their eight children. Hannah Ludwell Lee was born in 1701, a little bit younger, to Philip Ludwell II and Hannah Harrison Ludwell. And they lived at Green Springs Plantation, which is down by Williamsburg. I actually did the archaeology there years ago, and it's pretty cool. It's sort of in a full circle kind of way. I'm back now dealing with her you know, the legacy of her ancestral home here at Stratford Hall. She was incredibly wealthy. You're going to hear about her wealth and her prestige from Amy in a little bit when we talk about their marriage bond and what that did for the Lee family. The Lee men married well. The women that are a part of this family brought incredible wealth and prestige to these Lee men, and they would not have been as successful as they were without the money and support of their wives. So it's important to always give a nod to those Lee ladies as well. Oops, and I 
skipped. Oh, that's you. That's me. Sweet. All right. Now you're going to hear about their marriage and their love life. Not so intimate. But. <laughs> um, so it may come as a surprise to most people that marriages during the colonial era lasted around 12 years. And it wasn't because of quarreling or babies. It was because of the inevitable death. Um, so high mortality rates um, meant shorter marriages, um, perhaps several marriages in one person's lifetime. So the average life expectancy for a man in the 1700s was 48. Um, it was believed that one third to one half of children in this period lost at least one parent by the age of 20. And in the South, half of the children under the age of 13 had lost um, at least one parent. So the South was a pretty rough place to start out. <laughs> Um, so with that being said, um, there was frequent um, marriages and sometimes they weren't legally formalized um, for this reason. So um, in North Carolina, for example, a marriage certificate cost you 50 pounds, which was equivalent to the salary of a colonial teacher. So it was expensive to marry. So there was a lot of, you know, under the table kind of marriages. <laughs> um, so in our collections here at Stratford Hall, we have a marriage bond, which is over here, and that belonged to um, Thomas Lee and Hannah Ludlowy, and it was created in 1722. So what was a marriage bond? So a marriage bond was a, for prospective marital partners, um, they were required to file a bond with the governor. Um, by signing this bond, they were both swearing that they had no pre-existing marital um, contract. So this was an amount of money that the groom would be willing to pay as a penalty should it, it be found out that um, he is currently married already. Um, so it was a monetary pledge to the court to affirm that there was no moral or legal reason why the couple could not be wed. So there were three main legal reasons why a bride and groom could not marry. Um, these reasons were one, either one or both parties were of, not of legal age yet. Um, so if you were under the age of 21, you had to have parental consent. Um, either one or both were already married or the bride and groom were too closely related to be married under a normal marriageable age, um, which is interesting considering cousins got married and that kind of thing. Um, so the yeah, national... Yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't here. Um, in, at least in the UK, mm -hmm. you post bonds. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's not the same thing. Again. No, it's not that's, the same thing. Yeah. That's basically an intent to marry, so the whole congregation. Um, yeah, basically. <laughs> and these bonds were done like a couple of days before the wedding, so it was to ensure that yeah. the wedding okay. was going ahead. Okay. Um, so the National Archives over in London has a really wonderful currency converter. Um, which kind of gives you the sense of the kind of money we're talking about here. So um, he was willing to commit to paying um, 1,200 pounds, which is the equivalent um, of about 139,329 sterling, which equates to about 175,000 US dollars. So um, it's kind of a good incentive to, um, you know, get married because otherwise you're gonna be paying this penalty. Unfortunately for Thomas and Hannah, um, the bond did not need to be paid because there was no, nothing wrong with their, their marriage. So um, not many people actually know that Thomas Lee was previously engaged. So there was another lady before Hannah. And uh, this was when Thomas Lee was 26. And he was engaged to a woman named Jenny Wilson. Uh, but he ended up leaving Virginia to head to London in 1716 to um, buy the Cliffs property, which is property on site here, um, because he knew Robert King Carter was eyeing it up. And he was much younger than Robert King Carter, so he was able to make the journey across and basically swiped it out from under him. And Jenny Wilson um, was an heiress to about 3,500 pounds, which is equivalent to about 500,000 US dollars. So he envisioned this great majestic kind of expansion with the use of Jenny Wilson's money. But he came back to Virginia and she had been married off to her cousin, yes, by her, her guardian. So um, a couple of years later, he met Hannah and I feel like Hannah was the better match for him um, as we will see throughout these, this presentation. So I'm gonna hand it over back to Kelly now and do a little swap here. <laughs> little tag team it's easier for the bigger stage so 
I don't know if you've been to Burnt House Field. It's just down the road a little bit, but it's a really important site. It's actually where they're buried as well as Richard Henry Lee are buried. But this was their, um, the original Lee family home. Thomas Lee grew up there. It was his father's home. And they lived there before they came to Stratford Hall. So during the period when he went off to go swipe the land from Robert <laughs> Carter and was doing all of those things and courting Hannah, um, and then the woman before, he was living at Machodic, which is where they call now Burnt House Field. It actually ended up burning down, unfortunately. And there's a pretty cool story about that as well. So it burned in 1929. They pretty much lost everything. Um, there's this wonderful story. I'm not sure if you're going to mention it or not, but of the, the house is burning. Okay, the house is burning. And um, they saved the portrait that we actually have here in our collections of Hannah Ludwell Lee. That was really one of the only things that survived the fire. So when you think about the material world of the Lees, they lost everything before they moved to Stratford. So they were really sort of starting from scratch. And if you think about sort of losing your family heirlooms and what that would even do to you now, the choices of what they put in the house and how they had the house set up was very much what they wanted, not what their four parents wanted before them. So they moved, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it burned in 1729 and they basically ended up living with family while Stratford Hart, uh, Hall was being built. And let's talk about the biggest artifact here in their material world is the house itself. So we have here on the left, a rendering of Green Springs Plantation, which is no longer standing. It blows my mind and breaks my heart that a house that important to this nation's history is gone. It's just absolutely unbelievable. So this is a rendering that was done based on archeology span and architectural research to sort of show what the house was like. And it was of course so much earlier than Stratford Hall. It was built in 1645. And you see this very grand sort of, you know, um, sort of British style home, which is pretty spectacular with the outbuildings, et cetera. And you think about if that was your family home, if you're Hannah, and that's the house that you grew up in and you get a chance to figure out what your house is gonna look like because your husband just bought a bunch of land on the Northern neck of Virginia and is going to have, you know, Thomas Lee was very involved in the slave trade. He had enslaved laborers come over and help build this house so that they could really figure out anything they wanted to. If they, if they wanted it to look a certain way, it could be that way. There is no known architect of Stratford Hall, which is mind boggling, um, but there is some evidence that Hannah herself had a little bit of a say in what it looked like. Her son, Philip Ludwell Lee, which is one of my favorite Lees to talk about because he was very dramatic and made a lot of stew in the community. So it gives us a lot of sort of funny talking points, complained about her um, her, her mother, his mother designing this, you know, sort of flawed home. So she did have some say in what this house looked like. And square footage wise, it has more square footage dedicated to hospitality, to entertaining than most homes of this period of 1738. So Hannah absolutely, in my opinion, has a really, had a really strong handle on that. What do you want to ask? Yeah, just quickly, Green, Green Springs, did it just uh, die in the black we were asking, we were wondering the same thing and Judy, our archivist, isn't sure what happened. Uh, we know that the jail that was on the site is still partially standing, which is interesting. And I can't imagine, I'm going to have to look into that and see what happened, but I know I did archeology span on that site 20 years ago and there was nothing there, which is heartbreaking. So, you know, we got to hang on to our American treasures, you know, they're really important to, to all of this. Um, so the people that were living with, with them in that space, so again, I'll go back to the last slide. Um, this right here, again, is Stratford Hall. These steps right here were put on during the Fifth Kimball, you know, sort of architectural renovation period of the 1930s. They are not original to the house, but the rest of it, um, and except for the stairwells, is all original, the original bricks and everything. All of the materials used to build this phenomenal Georgian style home were done on site. The bricks were made on site, the nails were made on site, everything was done in the house. There are 16 chimneys and eight fire, uh, I'm sorry, eight fireplaces and 16 um, chimney, my goodness, eight chimneys and 16 fireplaces. I'm sorry, I need coffee clearly. The allergies are getting to me. Um, and so the entire house has this really, really intricate, very sophisticated for the time sort of chimney system that was built through the walls. So it's really state of the art, but it's also incredibly Georgian. Georgian architecture was all about symmetry and sort of showing off like big, bold, 
block buildings that are all symmetrical, but have this kind of grand state that you see when you go inside of the home. One of the things that we notice when people come visit, they see the outside of it and they don't realize how big it is until they go in. So the, whoever designed this home did it in a way to really sort of, you know, replicate this British manor home, but do it in a way that was to Hannah's desires, right? To the Leaf family's desires. The people that lived um, with the Lees uh, during their entire tenure at Stratford were a combination, of course, they had a bunch of children, right? They had eight kids, but they also had um, a significant number of indentured laborers at first, um, European folks. Richard Minot was the first chef here. I'll talk about him in a little bit. He was from England, um, but they also had enslaved nursemaids and butlers and manservants. And so you had a, at some points up to 200 enslaved laborers working on or around the property. So the Lees were very much in daily, you know, really hourly contact with enslaved Africans. And these Africans came directly from West Africa. They probably didn't speak English. So you can imagine the kind of cultural sort of interactions that were happening in these certain spaces. And it's really important to sort of think of that as you start thinking about the food and some of the other cultural things that we'll be talking about in a little bit. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Amy. Um, this painting, I think, is a wonderful image and perfect example of dress from the 1730s. So it is titled Tea Party at Lord Harrington's, and it's an oil on canvas by artist Charles Philip. So it's a British painting. Um, and it gives us a sense of like huge range of textiles and colors um, of the period. Um, so and dress history can even tell us um, about people's hierarchical status. So this guy over here, I'll mention later. Um, and I should preface before I begin this that each of these themes could be a lecture in itself. So this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind. So just bear with me. <laughs> yeah, little snippets. So let's break down women's wear um, in 1730s. So um, prior to this period, we about 1670s to um, 1700s, you know, hair was a lot wider. Their dress followed a very similar silhouette, but the colors were darker and they were richer. Um, funny thing about hair is hair trends have a tendency to go from wide to really close to the head to really tall. And it fluctuates like this throughout history. So when you think of Edwardian times, the 19 teens, we go into the 1920s again, very close to the face. 1940s, 1950s, we're getting higher and higher beehive in the 60s. So it did this, it's not been doing this for centuries. Um, why? Because we as humans get bored. And two, because of various societal influences, be it war, religion, uh, ec the economy, you name it. So a dress is constantly, a dress and fashion are constantly influenced by society. And you'll hear me say the word dress or dress history um, over fashion history. Um, the reason for that is because the term refers to um, apparel, um, including the everyday clothing um, that's excluded from you know, the main fashion trends that we're seeing. Um, and it doesn't mean that fashion didn't influence dress at any point, um, but I like to think of dress as if you're a character in a film, it's your costume. So it is the reason that the enslaved people were modifying cowrie shells and beads it is the reason my grandmother doesn't wear green because she thinks it's bad luck. So um, it's demonstrating mourning um, the dead through wearing black clothing. So um, I will be referring to it as dress history over fashion history. So we're going to look at um, powdered hair. So these ladies, they've all got gray powder in their hair. So there was two main reasons for this. Um, one, it was aesthetic. It showed your um, status, um, showed you came from money. Um, another reason was for hygiene. So head lice was pretty rampant in the 18th century and women would powder their hair. Um, they would apply an animal's fat to the hair, but an enslaved woman likely applied it. And she would then powder the hair um, in like a cornstarch or like a zinc, which is very toxic. Um, and so it kind of works as this uninhabitable environment for head lice, um, dry shampoo, and essentially um, hairspray. So it helps mold these elaborate hairstyles. Um, and then we have these little lace caps you see on top of these ladies' heads, um, and they serve multiple purposes. You know, it was for modesty, religious reasons, 
reasons um, to protect from the elements or if you're just having a bad hair day, just mm -hmm. stick a lace cap on your head. <laughs> and so I want to point this painting here. This is French now. Um, this painting I chose because of her deconstructed garment and it helps um, me explain the el different elements to a gown. So we've got her, her main gown over here. Um, and this was worn much like a coat. So you would put it on and it would be open at the front. Um, and then you would have your petticoats underneath. Um, and you see here her stays are visible um, and she's wearing a chemise. So a chemise, again, hygiene lacking in the 18th century. So to protect your clothing from sweat because th these elaborate materials weren't washed constantly, um, you would wear a chemise underneath your dress and that would trap sweat and it would absorb sweat and protect your clothing. Um, stays um, was used to for the silhouette to create this very like square shape um, and essentially undergarments for women um, and they were boned with whale bone usually and we take a look at this lady over here she is wearing an apron um, women's garments were assembled with pins so there was no zippers no buttons um, and this apron gets the name pinafore because your enslaved lady's maid would place pins in her apron to assist you in dressing. So that's where the word pinafore comes from. Um, this is sackback dress. So there's two different kinds of dresses that we're seeing here in this um, these paintings. So we've got the French style, which is this dress here, a robe a la Francaise. And so it would flow, you'd have a train that would flow from your back. And then we have the English style, um, which can be seen here. And the, both styles came to America. So Hannah Ludwally likely would have been wearing either or, um, but in her portraitures, we see her in more of this English style. Um, so what are we not seeing? What is hidden under all this? <laughs> so we've got pockets. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the old nursery rhyme, Lucy Lockett lost her pocket, Kitty Fisher found it. Um, not a penny was there in it, only ribbon around it. So pockets were worn over your petticoat. Pretend there's a petticoat there. Um, tied around the wearer's waist and a woman could access a variety of items that she had on her through a hole in her garment. Um, and then we have panniers. So these change shape over the years. Um, in Hannah's period, they likely looked like this. Um, and Philip Ludwell, um, Hannah's son, um, her granddaughter Flora, um, daughter to Philip, was uh, recorded as having monstrous bustles in the 1770s. So these eventually got wider and wider. And you can just imagine as a woman trying to navigate space when, when you have all these layers, especially when you're wearing a stays busk. Now, these were inserted into the stays to give you this very stiff posture, but it also inhibited you from bending down to pick up something or your mobility. So you were essentially required to just sit or stand and someone else was doing that for you. Um, they're very decorative. I love these. I think they would look great on a wall. <laughs> um, this one here, we've got um, initials and then a date right there that says 1796. So they're really decorative items made from wood or ivory and they often weren't even seen. So it was just for the wearer's own personal pleasure. So we're gonna switch it up and talk about menswear now. Um, so these individuals, um, I think the artist either wasn't great with perspective or he was intentionally um, focusing on this individual and I have a feeling this is the Lord Harrington that we're we're at his house um, this guy over here it looks like he's a duke or some sort of member of the royal family with the blue sash and the red coat but um, so in the 1730s much like it was throughout the rest of the 18th century a man's garment was made up of several components um, so you you had your waistcoat you had your um, overcoat, which was likely made from velvet or wool, um, with these really distinctively large cuffs, like that's very 1730s. Um, wigs. Why is this not working? There we go. Oh, go back. There we go. 
Um, wigs, much like the women's need to powder their hair, men were adopting wigs. And again, it was a symbol of status, um, but men were shaving their heads underneath their wigs. So it was a bit of a faux pas for a woman to shave her head. So that's why they adopted powder. Men were wearing wigs. And um, just as I mentioned before that, you know, women's hair was getting wider and then taller and then smaller. The same was happening for men. It was just the opposite. So when women had very close hairstyles, men had these big long wigs and then throughout the century it was getting shorter and shorter while women's hair was getting bigger and bigger. Um, so the stockings you see here heavily there's it's not a great shot here but this is heavily embroidered and again another symbol of your status and wealth. Um, so this is a great image here I love this so this is a deconstructed waistcoat this is a waistcoat that is uncut so it would arrive and your enslaved seamstress would piece it together for you. So you can see here, we, these are the pockets. And then we've got the shoulder pieces here, the neck and the general waistcoat shape. So the waistcoat was the most elaborately decorative part of a man's um, outfit. Um, and he would wear the coat over it. So the back of the waistcoat was just like a plain linen because no one was going to see it. Um, so um, the different... You can see here 1730s to 1770s, 1790s. Um, some people may not notice the difference, but I love this stuff and I love the differences. So we've got these huge cuffs, this like A-shaped coat, really long wig, and the waistcoat goes right down um, into the breeches, baggy breeches too. And then we hit the 1770s and everything's a little tighter. Um, we've got this distinctive V-shape in the waistcoat. And then we hit the 1790s, which is probably my favorite um, period of fashion. Um, and the waistcoat is shorter and it's cut right across. And the breeches are usually a nude kind of beige color. And there's a very distinctive reason for this. And that reason is neoclassism. So neoclassism is a decorative arts movement from um, the late 18th century, early 19th century, and um, it's inspired by the classical antiquities. So ancient Greece, ancient Rome. At the time, there were archaeological discoveries of Herculaneum and Pompeii, and it was influencing everything from architecture, fashion, decorative arts, furniture. So by trimming your waistcoat and wearing pretty tight pants and nudish pants, they were honoring, and my face is in the way, <laughs> they were honoring the ideal male physique, which was the Greek or Roman hero. So this is Hercules over here. And we look at this and we go, how does that become that? But in their minds, it completely equated because we, we just went from these really baggy pants to now really tight, almost nude illusion. So that was honoring that muscular physique, the ideal man, the, like Adonis. Um, and we've got a waistcoat, couple of waistcoats in our collection and one of them's covered in sequins. And again, it cuts straight across and it's, he was clearly, you know, channeling this ancient Greek hero, but you have to really read between the lines. Um, so if we take a look, if you will work for me, uh, back at Hannah and Thomas, we can see Thomas fits right into Lord Harrington's party. Hannah, not so much, a little bit, not so much. So um, a lot of colonial American women um, had a more natural look because they're kind of trying to step away from this very you know, extravagant British appearance. And it, you think the British were extravagant, the French were even more extravagant. Um, and she's wearing blue in her portrait. Now the color blue is, uh, has, um, you know, we associate it with boys, pink with girls, but first, centuries it was associated with women and pink was associated with men and the reason is because the Virgin Mary wears blue um, so and pink was considered quite a strong bold color um, pinks and reds so it's probably why Thomas here is in a reddish color and um, then she's got this little red sash and I think that's a nod to her husband so I just told briefly about motherhood and childhood and then I'll pass it on to Kelly again um, so Hannah and Thomas were parents to 11 children, only eight survived, um, uh, two signers of the Declaration of Independence, so a wonderful uh, family that contributed to this, to this nation. Um, on the screen here, we've got this wonderful portrait, and 
if anyone knows where it is, please tell me because we don't know <laughs> where this portrait is. And um, in a book, it was misidentified, but recently um, it has come out that it's Mrs. Lud it's Hannah and her two eldest children. Um, so we've got a little Philip Ludwell Lee who did have a portrait commissioned when he was older, but again, who knows where that is? Unfortunately, we do not know. So the only surviving record of Philip's face is him as a little three or four year old. And then his sister, Hannah Corbin, who, you know, was a great advocate for women's rights to vote, um, no taxation without representation. She hounded her brother, Richard Henry Lee, um, about the women's right to vote. Um, and so I'm gonna put my art history hat on again. Um, we're gonna look at this little peach here. Um, Philip is holding a peach um, and peaches, um, fruit and flowers in art, um, there's a whole language that you can interpret. And um, with peaches, they represent fertility or new life. So I have a sea submission given the date of painting. It's around 1729, 1731, given the ages of the two children. I have a feeling we've got a pregnant Hannah Ludwell Lee here. Um, so I think that's pretty cool that we can kind of delineate that from this, just this little child holding a peach. Um, a lot of people are under the impression that this is a little girl and it's not. So boys in the 18th century wore gowns in the first few couple of years, made sense, mobility, um, potty training. Um, but they also wore stays, um, all children wore stays um, and that was for posture. Um, so it's very, very unusual. Um, so we've got a couple items in our exhibit um, that relate to Hannah and her children. So if you haven't been over to the visitor center, um, you can see Hannah, not this portrait, the other one, and these two objects. So here we have a housewife or a sewing purse. Um, and you can see this is it when it's opened up. You would insert your pins and needles in there. Um, and it was basically a traveling sewing purse. Um, and it belonged to Hannah Ludwell Lee. She likely embroidered it. So these are little strawberries um, and thistles. And it was passed down to six generations of women. Um, we have the christening gown over here. Um, this christening gown is said to have been worn by the two signers of the decoration um, and a couple of the other children and passed down right up to Robert E. Lee. Um, and you can kind of see that there's some 19th century modification in the sleeves. So it's, it's family history, it's old history, so we're not entirely sure it's true, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. And we'll go back to Kelly. To talk about food and feasting. <laughs> my favorite topic, I think. So Stratford Hall, in my opinion, and it's a pretty good opinion, because I think it's the best kitchen in America historic kitchen. I think it's phenomenal. It was original to the house. So you see it over here. Um, it was built the same time as the big house. It's this larger building right there. Half of it is a kitchen, half of it is a laundry. It has the biggest hearth I've seen anywhere in Virginia. If you have not seen our kitchen, you should probably go check it out before you leave today. But in, in the construction of the house, which was very symmetrical, very Georgian, etc., the Lees decided, and I think Hannah probably had a big saying this, to really take as much real estate of the inside of the kitchen for the actual kitchen part of it. So it's a kitchen laundry. And they actually, when you go inside of it, it eats into the side that would have been the laundry. Typically, you would have very symmetrical half laundry, half kitchen. It's actually mostly kitchen with a little laundry on the other side. This was a very um, sort of, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, a very intentional decision because the Lees ate like no other family. They were part of um, only three homes in Virginia during the 1770s that were eating chocolate and having chocolate made for them on site. So there were three chocolate uh, stones in the colony. Uh, Robert King Carter, the wealthiest man in Virginia, the governor of Virginia had one in his home and the Lees had one here at Stratford Hall. So I talked a minute ago about Richard Minot, who was the indentured laborer, who was the first, I called them chefs because they were definitely chefing. We wouldn't call them that back then, but they were making everything from scratch, elaborate meals for all of the Lees and all of their friends. The first chef was Richard Minot, and he had an indenture for his seven years. When it was up, Thomas Lee said, you have to stay, you can't leave. And that was not part of the deal. And so Richard Minot actually sued one of the wealthiest men 
Thomas Lee in the colony and won his freedom. So it's a really interesting story of this guy that was like, wait a second, you're not being fair. I know I'm a good cook, but I'm not staying in here any longer. It was at that point that they pivoted to using enslaved African and African Americans as chefs. And Caesar was an enslaved man who worked here during the middle part of the 18th century. They cooked feasts here. When I tell you that hearth is huge, I'm not exaggerating. They, they made dinners that would have literally, you would have seen at some of the castles in England, French influenced food, um, British food, absolutely. And so much of the food that they ended up eating as well was African influenced, things like gumbo, okra stew, things that are very Southern were literally West African recipes being brought into the kitchen and then enjoyed by everyone. They've become so much a part of our cuisine. So the Lees entertained like nobody else. I'm convinced if we went back to Thomas Lee era or the Philip Ludwell Lee era, you would have come here and eaten like a king or a queen. Three course meals, you know, at around two in the afternoon with multiple dishes. And I'll show you exactly the kind of stuff they would have been eating. So a three course meal would have been cooked in that hearth, which is kind of incredible. The first course, you would have had everything from fish to leg of lamb to mutton to stews. And then the second course would come out. So this really wasn't about you know, uh, eating to live, it was about living to eat. And this is really during a period in the colony when it had taken a hold, you know, it was successful. They had these plantation homes, women were coming over here in abundance and they could really create American cuisine. What were we eating here that's different from in England? The second course, you might find yourself eating pheasant or more meat pies or oysters or any amount of stews or vegetables or pickled meats or anything else. Imagine having to sit down and eat all that food. That's kind of outrageous, right? And this would have been maybe for about eight people or so. You sit down and it was all about showing off your wealth through the food that you were eating. And then the dessert course, if you will, would have been things like dried fruits, uh, maybe some chocolate if you're here at Stratford, and more sort of sweeter kind of things to end the actual supper. Of course, the pineapple is the universal symbol of hospitality because it was this rare exotic fruit. And I guarantee they were eating tons of pineapples here at Stratford because the Lees had connections to anything they needed. The probates here um, at Stratford Hall show an exorbitant amount of liquor in the cellar. The Lees not only ate, they drank and they partied like crazy. So what you would find in the probates, what we found in the probates is literal hogsheads full of rum and hogsheads. This is a barrel over here. Here's a hogshead. They're about as big as me and about this big around, full of rum from all over the Caribbean. They had cases of French champagne. They had Madeira that they insisted on, you know, crossing the equator to get that toast in the oak so they could sip it just right for dinner. So the Lees in there and very early on were very much ahead of the game. They were leading sort of the, the foodie world in Virginia way before Thomas Jefferson was doing his thing. And I love to say that because people think about Jefferson and Monticello as this sort of first American gourmet space. The Lees were knocking out of the park way before Jefferson was doing his thing with his macaroni cheese and everything else. Oops, I keep doing that wrong thing. Wait a second, where's the slide? Where did that slide go? Hold on here. It was a crab slide that I missed. It's okay. Let me find the slide just so I can show you what they were eating off of. Oh, it's right there. That's so weird. Oh, that's so weird. That is weird. That's okay. The ghost definitely did it. <laughs> okay. So when I talked a little bit ago about how Machotic burns and how they had to start from scratch. That meant that Thomas and probably more likely Hannah got to pick out what kind of china she wanted. They didn't have to eat off the stuff that their pans were eating off of. They could literally have the pick of the litter, if you will, for whatever kind of um, ceramic they wanted. They chose um, this beautiful 1740s, era 1740s, Chinese export porcelain, and it had crabs all over it. So it's a big nod, right, to the Potomac, sort of to this new space. She definitely wasn't living in crab land down in Williamsburg. It's definitely more of a crabbing area up here on the northern neck. And so they had an entire set 
of the ceramic, um, these ceramics here that they would have eaten on, you know, pretty much daily because they were so wealthy, they weren't going to be eating off of, you know, poor China um, or creamware, etc. What's interesting about this is um, we have a collection of the 1740s plates here in our in, in the house right now. What we found, though, is a collection of objects that were actually gathered by an enslaved person. <clears throat> and you see that crab plate right here. And these little objects right here, we've got a bunch of mid 18th century ceramics. We have nails, we've got shells. These kinds of pieces of garbage, if you will, were gathered by an enslaved person during this period and used to conjure their spirits. So she's in a moment is gonna talk about the ways in which the Lee women and the Lees, probably Thomas as well, sort of feared the unknown. How did they deal with ideas of ghosts and those kinds of things? The enslaved community, would gather objects that belonged to certain people and bundle them up and put them, they're called the cash, and they would use it, it's like a hoodoo conjuring tradition where you would gather all these things and you would conjure the spirits to come protect you in that space. So we actually have some of Hannah Ludwell Lee's China found in the attic in this little bundle of objects, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna pass it on to Amy and she's gonna wrap it up by talking about the ways in which the Lee's thought about fear. How did they use material culture? How did they sort of interact with the space to deal with their fears of witches and the unknown? So religion and superstition. So in 1604, a statute was passed by King James I, an act against conjuration, witchcraft, and dealing with evil and wicked spirits. So King James I is probably most famous for his Bible, the King James Version, um, which is the standard version for Protestants today. He also wrote his own book on demonology, um, which you can see on the screen here. So it was essentially a philosophical dissertation on divination and black magic. Um, was said to have even inspired um, Shakespeare and his Three Witches of Macbeth. So we have a king who is deeply rooted in these beliefs and very superstitious on the throne when the colonists first arrive um, in the early 17th century. So most Europeans at this time were very Christian, but they were very much of the belief that the supernatural world could influence the natural world. So when the colonists arrived in 1607, and as soon as they set foot, um, they believed um, that the indigenous population were associated with the devil, um, which of course is ridiculous. Um, and John Smith even described Chief um, Powhatan as more like a devil than a man. A Puritan minister named William Crashaw described Virginia in 1613 as Satan visibly and palpably reigns more than in any other known place in the world. So we have a deeply paranoid colony in a new land with new people, and it was only a matter of time before people started turning on each other. Um, so Virginia has the first witch allegation in all of the colonies. Um, Salem gets all the credit, but it started out here. <laughs> and I think we need to you know, like, reclaim, that. Really reclaim yeah. that and market that. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, most of Virginia's uh, colonial era court records were destroyed and during fires and civil war. So we don't know, we don't have as much information as Salem does in New England. Um, and of course, most of these cases were defamation cases or um, resulting in slander or gossip. So someone's wife said something bad about someone else's wife and she was accused of being a witch. Um, if, even if a woman was unmarried and she had a lot of money, it was easy to accuse her of being a witch. Um, so what did, what did Thomas and Hannah do? Um, what did the colonists do to protect themselves? There was very, various different means you could protect yourself, uh, but there's one thing they did at Stratford that's very um, iconic. So apotropaic marks. Um, so these are marks, or, uh, uh, witches marks or special symbols that are used to deter um, evil or witches. Um, Historians have debated if these are you know, some sort of 18th century graffiti or if they're there to ward off spirits. Um, but I think given the date the house was built in the 1730s and the last witch trial in Virginia was in the 1730s, I think everyone was very much of the belief that evil spirits existed. Um, especially with the high infant mortality rates, you did what you needed to do to protect your family. So we've got, various different shapes to Stratford. Um, this shape is 
honoring um, Virgin Mary. Um, so we've got these W and M, which are double Vs, um, and it stands for Virgo Virginium, so Virgin of Virgins. Um, so again, it's that Christian influence coming in to protect the home. So these are carved on um, spaces in Stratford um, where children usually reside. So these ones you see here are out, outside the schoolroom. And then this, this little square one you see in the corner, um, that is just below the nursery. Carved into the floorboards of the nursery, we have the daisy wheels. We have a series of them in a row. Um, and they look like this. And the whole idea behind these intricate designs is that the spirit would get trapped and couldn't figure its way out. Um, so window, um, windows, <laughs> witches came in through windows and fireplaces and the nursery is home to two windows and a fireplace. And so these appear in a series of six on the floor and they were only found about 10 years ago. So it's really interesting. And our probate inventory um, lists a compass in this room at one point. So it's very likely that um, either a Lee or an enslaved person did it for the Lees. Um, over here, we've got another daisy wheel. It is very faint, but it's on the shutters in the main chamber, which is the room right next to the nursery. Again, another room where children were. Down in our service area, our servants hall, um, we have these wonderful original shutters and they have a series called concentric circles. And just like the daisy wheels, the spirit would get sucked in and um, couldn't make its way out. Um, so really interesting. And these are, all these shapes are found um, throughout um, European and English homes um, throughout that period. So the last thing I'm gonna talk to you guys about is death. So the passing of Hannah and Thomas. Um, Thomas, uh, Hannah died in 1749 at the age of around 48, 49. So that was kind of that age that I was telling you earlier. Um, and Thomas died the following year. And both are buried at Burnt House Field, um, about 20 miles from Stratford. And it's really um, majestic kind of place. It's this brick cemetery in the middle of the field. And um, Richard Henry Lee is there. And it's just very, very quiet and uh, contemplative. Um, so, you know, grief stricken, Thomas wrote his will a couple of months after Hannah's passing, and he described his funeral wishes. Um, those were to be buried between my late dearest wife and my honored mother, and that the bricks on the side next to my wife may be moved, and my coffin placed as near hers as possible without moving it or disturbing the remains of my mother. So I'd like to think that they were a marriage founded on love and not just on money, um, especially with those words he, he put in his will. So I think that is our awesome. So all in all, you just heard lots of little windows into Thomas and Hannah's life, the ways in which they decided to eat, the beliefs they had, the clothes they chose to put on, the powder they put in their hair, and the ways in which they decided to be buried for life. So um, I'm going to end it by thanking special thanks to the Thomas Lee chapter of the NSDAR for their generous support of this program. Again, the DAR has been incredibly supportive. We're actually here at Stratford, um, a shrine for the DAR. So it's an honor to be a part of that wonderful organization. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this and wrap this up. And if we have any questions from you all or anyone here on Zoom, I am happy to answer. I'm sorry. Do you have anyone? Yeah. Okay. Any questions at all? Had you all seen those witch marks before? Yeah. So cool. Um, I think it's kind of silly, wasn't um, okay. Yes, and that's um, likely because she was. Um, making a statement that she didn't want to be associated with the flamboyance of the English. It's pretty cool. So, um, in the, I'm sorry. Jim, you know, raise your hand. Oh, you're good. <laughs> um, in regards to the genealogy of Robert E. Lee, where does that all fit? Uh, Thomas, Thomas's son? Thomas is. <laughs> Granddaughter married like right. Fort Carey. Um, they had a child together, the child passed, Matilda passed. Lighthorse marries Anne Hill Carter, and that's where the 
property these okay. So it's not a complete direct, but yeah. the family is because they also, all those families were trying to protect their wealth. So they all intermarried with cousins. It's normal, okay. you know? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So the tree is a little tangled, but yeah, yeah definitely, definitely part of that tangled web yeah. of the Lee family. It's a huge family. One of the things that I find so fascinating about the Lee family is that we think about these really important Americans, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, all of these people. The Lees were like this dynasty. They were this big, rich family that, I mean, they had two brothers that signed. They were known everywhere. So they were this very wealthy, famous family that had multiple players. I mean, we're learning more and more about Arthur Lee. He's a phenomenal a human yeah. being. His story is fantastic. Nobody knows about him. So there's all of these really important Lees that were major players in our nation's history. It wasn't just the Thomas Jefferson. It was just this big royal family, you know, in so many ways. It's pretty incredible. The dynasty was, is incredible to sort of think about. We got no questions. I'm going to go ahead and end the Zoom. Thank you so much.